Okay, uh, while I'm waiting for the other few other people to, to log on here, um, <clears throat> on Mondays, uh, we do ask Larry. Um, so if there's anything you want to discuss, questions you have, uh, please, you can always email them to me at broker Larry, the numeral one. So broker Larry one at fairfaxrealty.com uh, to make sure that uh, I cover them on Monday. Um, Wednesdays, as you know, we are just literally taking the sales contract and con uh, different contingency forms, et cetera, and just going through it line by line uh, to discuss what my opinion of what it says. Okay. So let's go ahead. I think we've got most people that are going to be joining us. I think we have them on here now. So welcome. Uh, if you have your contracts package, uh, I am dealing, I'm working with page 24. It's called Contingencies Clauses Addendum Form for NVAR. It is form K1344. Uh, if you don't have the package. So you can always go to NVAR, uh, log on, uh, and uh, download forms that we use from there if you do not have it. Okay. Um, so let's just work our way through this. Um, this addendum is made on uh, whatever day. Uh, if it's the, if you need one of these clauses when you're writing the contract, uh, needless to say, it would be the same day, but could be later. To a sales contract <clears throat> offered on the date, that's the dates in the first blank, not the date that it was ratified uh, by buyer and seller. For the purchase and sale of the property, I think that's all pretty self-explanatory. Um, the key here is the following provisions, if initialed by the parties. So if it's not initialed, uh, it is not part of the contract, right? Or incorporated into and made part of this contract. So the first contingency, sale of the buyer's property and kick out. So if you are representing a seller, you get a contract that comes in on your listing and the buyer has a home to sell, uh, we would be using one, okay? Uh, then 1A, uh, the difference between 1A and 1B, uh, 1B, you get a contract on your listing and the buyer already has a contract on their property it's just contingent upon that property settling. So we're going to deal with 1A first. You have the contract come in on your listing. People have a house to sell. This contract is contingent until 9 p.m., X number of days after date of ratification. Um, and this is in order for them to get a contract. So you need to be having a discussion with your seller. If we give them 30 days to get a contract in, more than likely, it's going to take another 30 to uh, 45 days after that to get a settlement. So you need to have a, a good heart-to-heart -heart talk with them uh, as to what their time frame is for moving and how big of a hurry they're in. Okay? Uh, so uh, I would put, if I was representing the uh, buyer, I would try to get you know as many days as I could. But pretty much what I see is 30 days after date of ratification. Uh, remember, date of ratification is defined in our contract as everybody signed and it has been delivered to the party that needs to receive it, not the day that your seller initials. It's when it gets back to the buyer that we start counting these days. So if it takes three days for it to get back to one party or the other for whatever reason after it's all signed by everyone, you don't start counting your days till then. Everybody okay with that and understand how you count the days? Now, upon the sale of the buyer's property located at such and such address, buyer's property, if buyer does not satisfy, amend, or remove this contingency by the deadline pursuant to subparagraph three below, this contract will become void. It becomes void automatically, okay? So if it's gonna become void automatically, uh, no, nothing needs to be signed. Okay, there's no notice required. It's going to happen automatically. So what you probably need to do 
is if you have a contract it's, uh, and they don't have a contract on their house yet, then you may very well want to do an extension of the contract if everybody's still okay with that. Uh, in this market today, that uh, probably doesn't make sense. But if it's a market where um, we have a six to eight month supply of homes for sale, and I know that's hard to believe, but we do have markets like that. If it's six to eight months, uh, they may want to continue to try. Okay, so it's, it's a function of the market, but you need to have that discussion with your uh, um, seller. Okay, now, seller may continue to offer the property for sale and accept bona fide backup offers to this contract until this contingency is satisfied or removed. Unfortunately, when you, with um, uh, Bright, it's going to have to be under contract with, and, and continue to show so that might limit how many people might be looking at that property in a normal market. But in this market, it may not be that big, big of a, a negative, right? Uh, because um, people are writing offers on anything they can find. So if it's a, uh, you know, this contract is contingent upon the sale of another home, uh, and you have a person that has no contingencies, you could very well end up kicking this out. Okay. Everybody understand what a bona fide contract is. That is not something you go out and get somebody to write a fake contract just so you can kick this out and get the house back on the market as active, all right? If a backup offer is accepted, seller will deliver notice to buyer requiring this contingency be removed or satisfied pursuant to subparagraph three below. So deliver the notice. Uh, remember these capital letters in these sentences. Deliver is capitalized, right? Which means it has to be delivered to wherever it says in paragraph six of the contract. <clears throat> now, if it has the seller's name or the buyer's name in there, uh, I also send a copy to the listing broker. Okay. Any any questions about that? Why should we deliver to the uh agent and the broker uh i sent it to the i said so if paragraph six had the buy, not the broker i sent it to the agent but if paragraph six had the buyer's name okay remember paragraph six is delivery and it says everything has to be delivered to this person or this address or whatever so if it had in there the the um, buyer's email address okay and we get a backup offer, uh, we get a, another contract in, and we have to put them on notice. I'm, I'm putting everybody on notice, but it has a capital D here. So technically it has to be delivered whoever's in paragraph six to your contract. I also do a courtesy to the, uh, to the uh, agent. Now most agents get upset when something goes directly to, um, to their client, okay? But if that's what it says in paragraph six, I'm, I'm doing it. Uh, if you have your contract there, um, let's take a look at paragraph six real quick to make sure that you understand what I'm saying. So if you, can, if you go to paragraph six of your contract, it says delivery. And remember, it's capital letters. So deliveries in paragraph 6B would be addressed to the buyer um, by mail or whatever they choose, okay? So if, if there's a capital D for delivery of notice, then buyer and seller agreed, everything has to go to whoever's here. So if it says to buyer at their email address, not their agent, right? Then I'm sending it to that, to that email address of that buyer and I'm sending it to the agent, okay? But if some agents are gonna get upset and say, you have no right to be contacting my client. Well, unfortunately, that's what our contract calls for. So I'm not going directly to, you can't negotiate. And let's make sure you understand, you can't negotiate anything with my buyer client as a listing agent. However, if you're following the terms of the contract, um, no one should get upset. The problem is not everyone knows 
what the capital letters and all in these contracts mean. Okay, so that's why I say I send it to both, just to, just to cover our our bases. I don't want anybody coming back with an attorney saying, "Well, you know, delivery was capitalized. You didn't deliver it to the proper place, therefore there was no delivery." Uh, I don't want to get into that argument. Okay. Now, not later than 9 p.m., X number of days after delivery, the notice of this contract will become vo void. So I think three days is plenty there. Uh, one day is probably enough. Uh, but remember, anything that is delivered, okay, in our contract starts the day after delivered by definition, everything except for POA and condo docs, right? So uh, after delivery of the notice or this contract will become void, it becomes automatically void. Okay, so if they can't remove their contingency, if we give them three days, come 9 p.m. on the third day following delivery, so that's actually four days from the day you actually send it, okay, then their contract automatically becomes void. And remember our contract says, when, some, when a contract becomes void at no fault of either party, then everybody will execute the release of the contract <clears throat> and the deposit. The contract's already void at that time, so it's not enforceable, but you still want to have the release sign so that um, that buyer gets their deposit back. They did not cause a default, so therefore they're entitled to their deposit, and it says everyone will execute that release, if you remember that clause in our sales contract. Okay? If buyer fails to satisfy or remove this contingency by deadline, this contract will become void. So once again, if we had 30 days and we haven't extended it, okay, and they haven't removed their contingency because they did not get, uh, cannot do it under paragraph three that we'll look at, uh, then the contract's automatically void. At midnight on the night a contract becomes void, your seller can, all, can put their house back on the market. They don't need releases signed because it's no longer a contract. The releases are, uh, for, I'm gonna come back and sue you later for damages, that type of thing. So everybody okay with this? Any questions about this? Okay, then let's look at paragraph two of this. Buyer's property will be listed exclusively. That's an exclusive right listing agreement and actively marketed by a real estate broker and entered into a multiple listing service within three days. Uh, our rules say that any listing you get has to be in the system within three days after the date of ratification at a price not to exceed. Now, listing agents, how do you know the price they're choosing isn't so unrealistic that they would never get a contract and your person is basically uh, hampering the marketing of their property? You can unmute your microphone if, if you want to. Yeah, go to if, RBR to find. Okay, so absolutely. Yeah. Go, go, I, to RP, go to RPR, okay? If you're not familiar with RPR, Realtor Property Resource, you, you can go to NAR, RPR. If you're not on there, to, I want you on there by the end of the day. Go to National Association of Realtor, Realtor Property Resource. Uh, log in, log, sign yourself up. Uh, you need your NERS number. You need your uh, uh, bright number and your email address that NAR has. You can do a market analysis on any property anywhere in the United States. And you can pull a property report up in a matter of two minutes, if that long, okay? Um, another reason to have that, if I call you about a listing, okay? It's not your, your listing. You can sit there real quickly, log on to that system, do a property report, and the property report will pop up immediately. So you can be talking to them about the house that they're calling you, and you can actually see it. If I'm going to call somebody that's coming here from another part of the country, I do an RPR report on their home so I can see the house that they're living in, okay? So I can, you know, talk to them about is that you're trying to, you know, 
replicate what you have. So do an RPR report. Um, you can do a seller's report for, for that property. And if their price looks so unrealistic that it's not going to sell, uh, your buyer, I mean, your seller may not want to take the house off the market. So it will give you a range. It'll give you an RPR, but also give you a range. And if that property is at the higher end of that recommended range, um, I'd be having a heart to heart talk with my seller about, do you really want to pull your house off the market or just tell them if they get a contract, come back and, and we'll do a, a one B with them contingent upon their home settling. Yeah. Any, any questions? Yeah. And in that RPR, you can do a lot of stuff with, we'll, we'll discuss that on another session one day. Maybe we'll do that on a, on an Ask Larry session, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, paragraph three. Buyer Where are we? Does somebody have a question? Yeah, I was trying to figure out what page, what page we were on here. I'm, I'm on page 24 of 24. the contracts package. Okay. Did you find me? Uh, let's see. It's called Contingencies, Clauses, and Addendum. Uh, seller notice request comes up for me. Let's see. Uh, I got it. Okay. So it's page 25 for me. Okay. 25 for you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm in one a, the, uh, the contingency sale, the buyer's property and kick out. Okay, great. You're with me now. Yep. I'm here. Okay, good. All right. So we're down to paragraph three and this is where, uh, uh, they can remove their contingency, especially if we give them a notice that we have a backup offer. <clears throat> they can satisfy this contingency by delivering, and there's that capital D again, right? Mm -hmm. To a seller, a copy of the ratified contract for the sale of the buyer's property. But here's the key to this. With evidence that all contingencies, other than financing and appraisal, have been removed, okay? If there are any other contingencies, then they can't remove their offer. So if there's a home inspection contingency, well and septic, whatever, they can't remove their contingency for the purchase of your seller's home until those are all satisfied. So any contract they get in pretty much going to have to be an as is contract contingent upon only the uh, uh, financing and the appraisal. And that's why you need to make sure that in paragraph two, that the price they're saying is realistic because even if they get a contract in, um, at that higher price when you knew it wouldn't appraise at that. We're still contingent upon appraisal. We're still waiting, what, 30 more days to find out whether or not your seller uh, has a, a contract that's gonna settle. So it's, it's, you've gotta make sure that uh, value they're listing at is um, uh, a, a reasonable value. And, that, and that's another reason you need to discuss with sellers about putting their house on the market and getting a contract before they go out and look because they're putting themselves in the weakest position. You know, they have to put their house on a market at, at the lower end of the market uh, and, and everything. So it's a disadvantage to them also. So you're better off uh, if push comes to shove and they're a little hesitant to do that uh, to at least use uh, paragraph 1C that gives the buyer the right to go out. I mean, seller a right to go out and find a, a replacement home. Okay, uh, but don't put them, you know, the stronger position you can be in, the better off they are. So it works both ways, right? Uh, so everything has to be uh, removed or waived except for financing and appraisal, or B, they can remove this contingency by delivering to seller a letter from the lender stating that the financing is not contingent in any manner upon the sale and settlement of any real estate or obtaining a lease of any real estate and that the buyer has sufficient funds available for the down payment and closing costs necessary to complete the settlement. Well, you know, if, if they had that capability, then why in the world did they even make their house, this contract contingent upon the sale of their home? Uh, that, that makes no sense to me because it puts them in a, weakest negotiating position because the seller wants more uh, if, you know, if it's a contingent contract than a non. But 
you know, if they can do it, that now they have the evidence or evidence of sufficient funds available to complete settlement without obtaining financing. Um, and so evidence is, uh, I want a copy for, I want something from the bank, right? Stating these funds are here, uh, you know, not that you tell me you can do it. So um, lender from the letter, a lender letter, uh, how much faith do you put in a lender letter? Uh, lender is not part of the contract, right? So be careful with, uh, with when they remove it that they have the funds if they didn't have the funds in the beginning. Any questions about paragraph three? You guys are quiet today. <laughs> okay. Uh, paragraph four. If buyer, and this is on page 25 of mine, 26, I think, if somebody else is there. If buyer satisfies the requirements of subparagraph 3A above, this contract will remain contingent upon the settlement of the sale of the buyer's property, but it's only contingent upon what two, uh, two things, appraisal and financing of the buyer. This paragraph will survive the satisfaction of the contingency for the sale of the buyer's property, okay? So um, what does all that mean? So once we're under contract, right, they only had 30 days to, to get us a contract. That, that would sunset now because we have a contract. So it survives that 30-day period we were talking about. That's why I'm saying I'm talking to my seller to say, hey, they had 30 days to get a contract, probably another minimum 30 days to get the settlement. We're talking 60 days if it gets all the way to the end of this contingency period before they get it, because once we get the contract, that part's over, we still have to wait for settlement. So uh, if you have flexibility for your move, then uh, you know we can do this. It, but if they bought another home and they have to settle, this isn't gonna work, is it? Okay, unless they have cash to settle on the one they're buying. Okay, so, Settlement under this contract may not be delayed more than X number of days after the settlement date specified in the contract without the party's written consent, okay? So um, what, if the, what, if, uh, what if the title work just isn't done in time? Okay, we, we met all the other requirements on this, this contract that they had to sell their house, but there's a, a, a delay for title or something or another. Um, if you remember that paragraph, it says, paragraph 20 says, uh, if the title work just isn't ready, all right, then the buyer has how many more days automatically? 10, right? Uh, 10 business days, which is 14, uh, at, which, at the end of which the seller could uh, void the contract if they don't want to extend it. So if here's where you would reflect I'm not delayed more than uh, 10 days, whatever. Now, here's the key to this. If you have more than 10 days, it could be delayed up to no more than 10 days here. Your buyer is buying a, pro a, a house and they, uh, they uh, wrote their contract using paragraph B that it would be, uh, you know, that, that it's contingent upon the person buying their house settling. And there's 10 days here in this paragraph for the buyer. Then you better make sure you have at least the same 10 days in paragraph B that you used with your seller to purchase another property. Otherwise, if they don't match up and that first contract doesn't settle and they had the right to extend, you put your seller in a position of being in a possible default because they won't have the money to settle. You understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, one more time. Can you give us an example like uh, that way? Okay, so in pair and let's look at paragraph four again, right? Mm -hmm. So settlement under this contract may not be delayed more than 10 days after the settlement date. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had, uh, we have a contract on the buyer's property, right? The mm -hmm. buyer or seller's house. 
um, for some reason, the um, um, title work wasn't ready. It was just something that just wasn't ready on the attorney side or the, you know, whatever. And they needed three more days. Okay. So here you might put 10 days after the settlement date, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to, so that they after have the, After the buyer settlement, right? Well, see, this is, this is the settlement of the buyer's property, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if settlement under this contract, so if, if, this, if the buyer's property couldn't settle on time, mm -hmm. they, they may wrote in here, we have 10 more days after settlement date without the party's written consent if we need more time to get ours to settlement, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're automatic, or you could put zero or whatever, but if you put 10 days here, then then this contract or my seller's house could be extended up to 10 days uh, without written consent if that buyer needed that additional days. So if that's the case here in paragraph B, the sale of a house, now your mm -hmm. buyer went out to buy another house, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and with their contract, they said, look, I can't settle on your house, seller, until the buyer settles on mine. So now the, the, your buyer, who was the seller, you with me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now has to use paragraph B. They can't settle until this buyer that they have settles. So if, if we have a contract, right, before we went out, it says here settlement under this contract may not be delayed more than the next number of days after settlement date without the party's written consent. If you don't use the same number of days from paragraph the, the, the buy, paragraph A for the buyer sell, you know, buyer buying your seller's house, and there's a delay in the settlement of your seller's house, you better match that delay up in their purchase of the next house by putting the same number of days. If it said 10 and four, it should say 10 and B. That way, if your buyers, if your seller's settlement is delayed, then they're not going to be in default on the property they're buying because they also have that same 10 day period. I see. Okay. Because otherwise, um, if, if, if we'll call your seller A, right? And the buyer B, if mm -hmm. B, if B uh, can't settle, okay then your, your, your buyer C, which was A, yeah, this gets confusing, right? So we need to make please. sure, okay, let's keep this simple. If, yeah. if the buyer buying your seller's house has 10 days in paragraph four, and your buyer, your seller needs the money to buy a new house, yeah. right? And it's contingent upon the settlement of their contract they have on their house then put the same number of days in this blank that's in four to protect okay. them. Because if, if they don't have that, okay, then the day that they were supposed to settle, now they won't have the funds if that settlement under paragraph four is extended any period of time past the settlement date. So therefore, you're, you're gonna put your seller in a position to be defaulting on their contract when the other person isn't default on the one that they're buying. So you got to protect your seller if they are going out to buy and, and see how these, these things could stack up and everybody's at a disadvantage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody's at a disadvantage, but either way, if you if your seller needs to have the money to go out and buy another house, it's going to be contingent upon the party sidling on their property. It, it just all stacks up. That's why I tell people sell your house, put your stuff in storage, go into a temporary rental, then let's go out and negotiate for a purchase of your house. We're much stronger negotiating position. Because you're negotiating from a you're, you're negotiating from a position of weakness when you when you do this. Mm -hmm. so, Larry, is it possible to put zero days? Absolutely. Okay. A and if, absolutely. if if the buyer, potential buyer is not uh, settled yet, can he uh, 
make additional um, addendum to the to the potential to the to the seller to extend the the um, period on settlement. Yeah, you could. Yeah, if, if they would if they would agree to to the extension. But okay. well, I tell right. you what, uh, probably half the cause I'm getting right now uh, is where um, people people didn't settle and they need extensions, and now the sellers are asking for house payments and and all kinds of different stuff out there. They're not they're not taking it. They're not sitting back taking it anymore. They're saying, look, I've got these costs for these extensions. This way, if you had 10 days and 10 days, it's an automatic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a matter, it's also gonna be a function of the market, but yeah, you could, you could do an addendum that way, right? Yeah. Let's go through these again and, and see if it clears up, right? Uh, okay. So we're not gonna delay more than X number of days after settlement date specified in this contract without the party's written consent. So when you write a contract, Okay, maybe this will help clarify. When you write a contract, even when it's contingent on the sale of the seller's house, mm -hmm. I mean the buyer's house. The buyer's house, yeah. Okay, you're still going to have in your actual contract a settlement date. You with me? Right. Yeah. So, so uh, if you're representing the buyer, and this is going to be contingent for 30 days for the settlement of for you to settle on, on this seller's house. How many days are you probably going to ask for settlement? 40 days. At least 40, 45, mm -hmm. maybe 60 mm -hmm. days because you okay. still got to get your house sold and mm -hmm. then you need at least 30 days. So if it took 15 days to sell their house, right? Mm -hmm. And you got it under contract and it takes another 40 days to settle we're 45 days, all right? So okay. what happens at the end of that 45 days, since we were cutting it kind of close, if they needed this additional 10 days? That's where this 10 days come in. Okay, automatic. But, but, mm. but, so, but I see agents, when they write their, their contract, they're putting 30 day settlements and the seller has a house to sell, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, so if you're doing that, and, and so an agent might do this to you. They might put 30 days settlement. That looks good. But back mm -hmm. here, they might put 30 days. And how many people pay attention to the contingency addendum? No one. Not a lot. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if we had 30 days settlement in the original contract, and I said we could go past another 30 days here. Yeah. Now I'm talking 60 days. So. I usually see about 10 days here because you might need it if you had a 45 day settlement in your contract. You don't get a contract within the first, you know, 15 days, but they had 30 days to sell. So you got to match these dates up. Does that make more sense? It does. And also, Larry, when, when if, if they get a contract in 15 days, then it starts counting from that day. It doesn't give them that leverage of the extra 15 days. No. It doesn't. Okay. That's why, that's why if you only put a 30 day settlement and they only have 15 days for that buyer to settle on their house, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay. Right. So in a multi-contract presentation, what's the likelihood you would get your contract through with a house to sell anyway? You're going to be the first one kicked out, right? Yeah, exactly. So unless there's a real incentive for the seller not to, uh, to do this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So back to paragraph four, right? If a further delay is required to obtain coinciding settlements, what is a coinciding settlement? Coinciding settlement. Okay. And that's an old term that you may not be familiar with. I need the money from the sale of my house this morning to go to settlement on the house I'm buying this afternoon. So that's coinciding settlements. They're gonna happen in the same day. It's not gonna happen, okay? Mm. If it's gonna be coinciding settlements, okay? Then we go back up here where it says, seller will or will not accept an assignment of funds, okay? 
if further delay is required to obtain coinciding settlements. So uh, if there's going to be coinciding settlements, somebody's going to have to use an assignment of funds because we're a wet settlement state. You can't, you, the funds from the settlement this morning will not be available for the settlement this afternoon unless what's happened. And you have the same lending, I mean. Well, even if you had the same lender, it still has to be recorded and, yeah. what, and, and the funds clear the bank before the title company is going to do what? Uh, They're not going to cut a check to you. Okay. Right? until the funds clear okay that's why that's why when you settle your buyer has to either send the money in wire the money in or bring certified funds okay yeah. so that a certified check will clear in 24 hours personal checks 72 hours okay so until that happens so what's the likelihood that we'll have a coinciding settlement the other problem today you have a buyer who has a lender right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have a seller who's buying a home that needs these funds. They have a lender. Both of these lenders have to give to the per to their client, the buyer in each case, a CD, a CD. Yeah. Three days prior to settlement. Three days. Three. How are you going to get two lenders to coordinate sending stuff yeah. at the same time? Yeah. We can't even get one to do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so more than likely, somebody's going to have to what? move okay? okay now we have rent backs and we have post occupancies they're the kiss of death okay more problems arise from those two documents than any other documents out there i just tell one party you need to settle you need to put your stuff and stuff in storage you know mm -hmm. uh, call your kids do whatever you know pay back time take a vacation do whatever but I'm spreading my settlements out by three days. Right. That way we have the flexibility and we have the money. Let's now, see. I'm not saying this can't happen. What has to happen in this case, if there's going to be an assignment of funds, that party that's getting the assignment of funds has to make sure that the attorney settling their property will accept the assignment of funds. Okay. Uh -huh. You have to make sure that the, the lender will work with an assignment of funds. Mm. So there's some coordination that has to be done. Not mm. telling you it's impossible, but it's improbable. Okay. Okay. In the old days, it was a little different because we didn't have this three-day rule and all that other kind of stuff. Now, remember back in paragraph five of your sales contract. Paragraph five said uh, the seller agrees to an assignment of funds. Okay. If they do, this is where you find the assignment of funds. So if you look at paragraph uh, five of your contract, um, okay? So if, if I go back there, it says down payment, um, yeah. an assignment of funds shall not be used without prior written consent of the seller, okay? This is where you get it, back here, okay? Mm -hmm. So if, the, if you're using a, where the buyer had to sell their house and whatever, uh, the seller, you know, uh, has to agree to an assignment of funds because otherwise they won't have the cash. Now, if I'm moving across the country, what do I care? Okay, I can wait. But if I need that money the same day, make sure the lender and the title company uh, and the seller agree in the contract that there will be a use of an assignment of funds. Okay. The way we used to try to make sure it happened is we always settled what? Both transactions at the same title. Wow. But you remember, you can't require somebody to use your lender, I mean, your title company as a seller. It's against the law. Yeah. Okay. Everybody okay with this? Buddy, yeah. how often these cases happening? Oh. How Not often? Very not very often right now because we're getting multi-contracts on most listings still, the really good listings. If that's the case and one buyer has no contingencies, the other one has a contingency for selling their house and you're the listing agent, which one are you recommending to your seller? 
Well, definitely first one. Okay, but if the market turns, okay, market changes, uh, which it will someday, okay, I'm starting now to see prices reduced on some listings, etc. Then you may you may see this again. But right now, it's it's not happening that often. But I have seen it a couple of times, and the people just didn't understand exactly what the paragraphs were telling them. Oh, but in, instead of uh, rent back, if you will sell your house and you will ask rent back for one week, it would be much easier transaction, right? Well, it's much easier for which party? Uh, for the seller, well, not the buyer, okay. because the buyer had not the buyer. Mm -hmm. Now, I just went over this in a question today, uh, early this morning. Um, there's going to be some uh, money given back and forth because the uh, seller, uh, the buyer couldn't settle yet. The seller wants money one month uh, for uh, their mortgage payment. And can you just write a check and give it to the seller for one month extension? No, all this has to be reflected in the contract, which now has to go to the what? Lender, because that's a, that's a, you know, a concession. So it's not that simple. Uh, with these rent backs, okay, where the seller's going to stay in the property for, for a week, okay? Uh, there's some things to consider. First of all, how many walkthroughs do you need to do as the buyer? Two. Two. One, to determine the condition of the property before you became a landlord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the second is when the person vacates because you were a landlord. And did you change your insurance over when you allow somebody to stay in the property because you're not occupying it and you became a landlord? Okay. Usually I not. mean, there's all types of things that have to be addressed. So to me, it makes more sense for one party to move out and settle later and rent somewhere and put your stuff in storage. But um, I, I just been around so long that the biggest problems we ever have are with these rent backs because now the uh the buyer goes in and says starts noticing things they didn't notice and they said well seller you did that while you were living there you had to pay me for it and the seller says no it was that way when i bought and there was no walkthrough none prior to the pre-occupancy okay everybody does the walkthrough when the when the seller leaves uh, you know how are you going to prove that you know that didn't happen afterwards uh, the buyer moves in, pre-occupancy. They did their walkthrough, right? But now that they've lived there for a week or more, they start finding all kinds of other things. They want to come back and try to make the seller pay for it. it to me, it's just, it's it's the kiss of death. Okay. Not saying don't do it, but uh, go over the pros and cons with people. Okay. Now, this continues on. So you understand an assignment of funds and, and coinciding settlements. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a coincide, if it's, uh, um, if a further delay is required to obtain coinciding settlements, buyer and by at the buyer's option, declare the contract void in writing. So the buyer doesn't have to keep going along with this. They can just pull the plug. Okay. But if they're going to do that, they have to send a notice to void the contract over um, to the uh, seller, correct? Because that was not automatic. Uh -oh. If at any time after the date of ratification, the contract for the sale of the buyer's property becomes void, buyer will immediately deliver notice to the seller together with evidence of such voiding, which would be the notice to void, right? And the release of the contract on the one that this property, at which time either seller or buyer may declare this contract void by delivering notice to the other party. Okay. Now the seller doesn't have the right to pull the plug unless this happens. Okay. So once I say, uh, I'll give you 30 days to sell your house, unless I get another contract in that I got to wait to that 30 days at midnight before that contract becomes void. Unless all parties would agree. Uh, wait a sec. If you get another a contract, you cannot send the potential buyer a note that you 
decided to take? No, you can. That's what I said. Unless you received a contract, okay, and it says it has to be a bona fide contract with no contingencies, right, other than finance and, and uh, appraisal. Result. Then the seller has the right to give the notice that they have X number of days yeah. you know, okay. to, to remove it. But otherwise, there's nothing in this paragraph. That, so the seller just gets tired of waiting after 20 days and says, I just void my contract. It doesn't work that way. Okay. 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 All right. Um, now, paragraph 2B, this basically is pretty much the same, except we don't have a house to sell. We already have a what? A contract. contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the settlement of this contract is contingent upon the settlement of the contract for the sale of the buyer's property located at. Okay. And once again, if you get this contract in and they, they have it, they have it already under contract. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to pull a what? I'm still going to pull an RPR report. Yeah. Okay. And I want to compare the value of the RPR report to the contract they got. Because it's still contingent upon that property, what? Appraisal. Appraising. Okay, mm -hmm. so I want to I want to give my seller as much information as I I possibly can, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and once again, cannot be delayed more than ten days after the settlement date specified in the contract. Specified in which contract? The contract to purchase on your seller's home, oh. right? But mm -hmm. we know things have been coming up. Uh, as a buyer's agent, I'm probably asking for a little bit more time here, maybe the extra 10 days. Once again, if I ask for an extra 10 days here representing my buyer, you're representing this seller as a buyer's agent on another property contingent upon this settlement, you're probably going to ask for at least the same what? 10 days. The same 10 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Protect them, right? Mm -hmm. After settlement date, without the party's written consent. So, we can all agree in writing to extend this, but it has to be in writing. And then we talked about the assignment of funds, right? If a further mm -hmm. delay is required to obtain, then the same thing, uh, you know, the, the buyer can declare the contract void in writing if, it, if we can't move forward. So, and we can mutually agree. So it's basically the same as as uh, a except for we don't have to deal with the contingency for the sale of the property they already have a contract mm -hmm. okay so right now we haven't had to deal with this but you know um it's we coming election. <laughs> we have an election coming up yeah. <laughs> things might change <laughs> it will change you know uh and you know, the, the, the financial environment might change and all kinds of different stuff could happen. Yeah. We have uh, uh, January 1 coming up where January 1, uh, people will be able to be evicted again. Properties will be able to be foreclosed on again. Um, so if you ever do one of these RPR reports, uh, do, mm -hmm. one for your, do one for your house, okay? Uh, and look at the neighborhood report. And if there's any houses around your house that are color red in the neighborhood report, okay, where it shows properties for sale, et cetera, what does that house in red mean? Foreclosure or something? Uh, flood? It, default, default mortgage? It, it means it's in some, some <laughs> stage or what? Default. Oh. They missed a payment. You might be shocked at how many people have missed payments out there, okay? <coughs> and it's all going to come to a head after the first of the year. Hmm. Okay. So, so you might, might, you know, you might need to know this stuff now, but you're definitely going to need to know it in the future, right? Uh, and, and once again, remember Wednesdays, we're just going through all the contract forms line by line right? <laughs> so eventually we'll get through all the forms, deal with the contract, and then we'll, we'll start doing this same thing with the uh, listing agreements. Okay. So paragraph C here. Um, your seller says, uh, 
I don't want to put my house on the market until I have my house sold, okay, or whatever. A um, little bit dangerous uh, because they're putting themselves in a negative marketing position. But if they get a contract on their home, they can make it contingent on finding a home of their choice. So oh. this just says contract is contingent until 9 p.m. X number of days after date of ratification to allow a seller to ratify a contract for purchase of an another home and conduct whatever due diligence seller deems necessary under the terms of the seller's contract to purchase another home. So unlike <laughs> Unlike the, the person buying their home, okay, yeah. any contract comes in, there can't be any studies. So this one, how many, how long would it take for your seller to find a house, get under contract, and do the studies? Uh, that's going to take a while. <laughs> okay. So how many days do you think we might be putting in here to protect at least our six, sellers? At least, at least uh, sixty or sixty days, at least. Okay. So. How many how many people are willing to, to uh, wait that long to see if they if they you know have bought a house? <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't, so, yeah. so realistically, you've probably given a week to find a house, and and you know probably fifteen days would be the max you could probably get away with here realistically, and we know that's probably not going to happen, right? Yeah. Now you could always go back, and you had fifteen days, and they found a house, got it ratified. Uh, you could always go back and, and do an amendment to the contract and addendum, uh, giving it another 15 days after that or whatever. But um, it's it's not not likely to happen right now. Yeah. Not, not in this area. Now, now remember, if you go to other parts of our market area, it's a little different. Uh, you come down to to uh, Mineral or Lake Anna, places like that. It's a little different down there than it is here. So you might be using some of this stuff in other areas, but in Right around the Beltway in Fairfax County, Loudoun County, probably not going to happen right now. But other parts of the marketing area, you'd be surprised. Okay. So this goes on to say uh, this contingency will terminate at the deadline. Contract will remain in full force and effect unless seller delivers notice to buyer prior to deadline that this contract is void. So this one doesn't automatically die. If you have this for your buyer, to, your seller to go find another home and they can't find it, you need to send a notice to void by the end of the 9 p.m. on the day specified here. Right? So this one doesn't, this one's not an automatic die like uh, paragraphs A and B where they don't get a contract and, you know, or remove their contingency. It dies automatically. This one you actually have to void or your seller sold their house and uh, they have to get out. Okay. And, and I had that question yesterday, uh, and, and I just want to bring it up right now. I'm going to bring it up again on Monday. Um, uh, people bought a house. Uh, they're renting right now. They bought a house, okay? And let's just say they, they, there was a rent back, right? And they bought a new home. So now your buyer allowed a seller to stay in the house for 30 days, right? Because they, have, they were having a house built. The night before your buyer is supposed to move in, now they've already given notice where they are, they have to be out, et cetera. You get an email from the person that did the rent back. Sorry, we're staying for another 30 days. Our house isn't ready. Mm. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? No choice. You have to accept, isn't it? You, you, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be tenants of suffrage. You could evict them, but how are you going to evict them? There's no evictions right now. Yeah, Even really? if you could go into court. Yeah. See, so, and let's make worst case situation. This one was uh, the people were renting and they were buying a house and the landlord had rented the house to another party who's expecting to move in. And they get a notice from the person, we're not moving out because our house isn't ready. Now you've got a tenant that your landlord's already signed a lease with, with me, mm -hmm. and, and the other party won't leave. What are you going to, somebody's going to get sued. 
<laughs> so how do you coordinate <clears throat> stuff? It's, and, and then you throw COVID in. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy out there right now to coordinate and try to coordinate, you know, settlements on, and whatever. It's kind of tough. And once, once you let that party in the property, how do you get them out? You, you let somebody post occupy because their loan's not ready. Yeah. And then they get turned down for their loan after living in the house. What do you have to do? Evict them. I mean, uh, you have yeah. to evict them. How do you yeah. go to evict them? Because there's no evictions allowed in the United States by the federal government law until December 31st. So if I needed a place to live free. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, do you see this kind of things <laughs> happening, Larry? I, I, mean, I wouldn't be telling you. I wouldn't be telling you about it if I didn't see it happening. <laughs> yeah, because I have—I mean, I have not seen something like that happen. Okay, well, like uh, you know, I get I get calls not only from our agents, but <laughs> I see. I'm pretty well known throughout the. <laughs> I know, we all know that. <laughs> so, I get calls from brokers and all kinds of people. <laughs> oh, good. And in my classes, you know, I hear these questions. So, good yeah. question. Okay. Um. Like in, in your scenario now, if uh, the number of days go past 60 days, so then isn't that another problem because that buyer was buying it for a primary home and they cannot rent back more than 60 days uh, their primary because it's not a lease, basically, it's less like a post occupancy, right? Oh, absolutely. You got all kinds of other problems. Yeah, and that's why I don't like post occupancies. Yeah. Uh, I because think. now the lender might consider that not not a rent back. They might consider it a what? A lease, and then lease. what? Then what happens to your 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 your, your investing? Your, investing, your, investing. Your, your loan is probably you know you know Nintendo. got a problem, etc. Absolutely. And what about the commitments for your loans? You know, uh, so yeah, there's all kinds of problems when you have rent backs and. and Larry, what what you personally would do if you would be in the same situation with rent back? I would never let anybody rent back, and I would never let anybody post occupy. I would never do any of that because of the things I just laid out there. I mean, uh, somebody needs to be inconvenienced and move, right? So if I'm the seller. And if people want to preoccupy my property, I'm going to tell them, no, you know, put stuff in storage. It won't cost you that much more. Right. Uh, and when you can settle, I'll be out of the house. Hmm. Well, from another hand, if the seller decided to uh, sell the furniture, um, by the closing, he sold the furniture, he sold all the stuff in the house and suddenly uh, the buyer, I don't know, died, for example. Uh -huh. What advantage for the seller to, to get out of the house at the settlement, especially, for example, if it's 1.8 millions, and it was furnished and you know it's, it's going to be a hassle i mean it's it's always going to be a hassle and and so when does a seller have to be out of a house by the settlement by the settlement right right so so if if uh now somebody dies that's a that's a unique situation and, and right. i've seen that also you know <laughs> on the day of settlement somebody got killed on the way to settlement in a car accident in a transaction with me, you know, about 30 years ago. Uh, and, you know, that's an unfortunate situation and everybody should understand and say, you know, this, you know, it says we can enforce it against the heirs and the signs, but hey, you're talking a year down the road, maybe just sign releases and be done. But um, with, with this other, uh, if a seller has to be out of their house, uh, six days prior to settlement, okay? six days prior to settlement, if I'm a seller, right? And we have not received the uh, uh, written commitment letters called for in, in you know, the, uh, com the uh, financing addendum. Okay. I'm sending a notice over to the other party, okay? 
that's when I'm sending notice that we have not received, you know, we do not have this. Uh, you have three days to either provide this, okay, or this contract is void because I need to cancel my what? My movers. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if they sold all their stuff, uh, maybe they need to get a sleeping bag or something. I don't know, but uh, um, it's, it's just no, there's no guarantees, folks. You know, um, we, we finally settled my, my father's uh, Civil War um, museum uh, to the Federal Land Trust people. And I told, the, I told my relatives, until I see the money clear my bank account as the administrator to the estate, you know, I don't count, I don't count it closed. You know, have you ever had a settlement where the, the, the finance company uh, refused to, to uh, finance the loan afterwards because of something that they didn't like in the paperwork. So even after you leave settlement, it still the lender still has to what fund a loan. Yeah. So I mean, I've seen this stuff happen. It doesn't happen very often, but I have seen it happen. And now the purchase is already in the house, uh, but the loan. So you know, we had to go back and, and work that all out. You know, and I had to remind the lender of uh, their CD and you, you have to do the commitment and all. So, but it still took a week afterwards and the seller saying, I want the buyer out of my house. Well, the buyer's already there. What are you going to do? Evict them, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah. I, I could talk to you about horror stories all day long, but we'll wait till Halloween for that. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'll scare you at Halloween. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, so we're gonna we'll pick up this next week with um, the next Wednesday with paragraph two, the backup kind, uh, the uh, uh, backup contracts and as is property, etc. Okay, okay. Well, and I'll see you guys. See a lot of you on Monday. We'll bring your questions on Monday, and we'll we'll discuss them. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Larry. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank, Thank you. you. Broker Bye. Larry, what? Larry. What? Your email. A broker Larry, the numeral one, mm -hmm. at fairfaxrealty.com. Thank you. You're welcome. Larry, yes. should we click on the same link as we did today for Monday? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank good you, day. Larry. You Thanks. have a good Bye. day, too. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.